Hello, dearest Lama Samati, dearest friends, thank you for being here with us. Hello, everybody, thank you. Okay, let's do the mudra and we'll um, offer the mandala. <clears throat> Here's the great earth filled with the smell of incense and covered with a blanket of flowers. The great mountain of four continents wearing the jewel of the sun and the moon. In my mind, I make them the paradise of a Buddha and offer it all to you. By this deed, may every living being experience the pure world. Idam Guru Ratna Mandalakam Niryatayame. I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, compassion, knowledge, and strength, the Dharma, the enlightened side of truth, and the song of the community of realized beings. From the virtuous merit I create, from the practice of giving with the understanding of emptiness, moral discipline with the understanding of emptiness, patience with the understanding of emptiness, joy severed with the understanding of emptiness, concentration and wisdom. May I attain the state of a Buddha for the benefit of all living beings. <clears throat> I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, compassion, knowledge, and strength, the Dharma, the enlightened side of truth, and the song of the community of realized beings. From the virtuous merit I create, from the practice of, Giving with the understanding of emptiness, moral discipline with the understanding of emptiness, patience with the understanding of emptiness, joy severed with the understanding of emptiness, concentration and wisdom. May I attain the state of a Buddha for the benefit of all living beings. I go for refuge until I am enlightened. To the Buddha, compassion, knowledge, and strength. The Dharma, the enlightened side of truth. And the Sangha, the community of realized beings. From the virtuous merit I create, from the practice of giving with the understanding of emptiness, moral discipline with the understanding of emptiness, patience with the understanding of emptiness, joy severed with the understanding of emptiness, concentration and wisdom, I will attain the state of a Buddha for the benefit of all living beings. Okay, <clears throat> rejoicing. Let's see, I'm going to start with Natalia. Okay, um, I'm rejoicing. I was able today to help a friend with uh, understanding of the alarm course. And uh, we we had um, discussion and it was very, very nice. It's very, it was very uplifting. Good. Okay. Svetlana, what do you have to rejoice in? Yeah, hello everyone. Hello, uh, the Lama Samadhi. Uh, I I would like uh to rejoice that uh today uh I uh, uh was able to connect to the Shuantam Tower classes. Uh, it was uh, early morning for me, yes, and it was uh, very precious classes. And I dedicate that uh, everyone has opportunity to attend, attend classes in life as well. Excellent. That's the, that's the way to see it in your future, that's for sure. Okay. Let's see. Let's go. Oops, I got to turn on the interpretation. Here we go. Let's go with Becky. No oh, good. Okay. I need to do one more thing here. I need to open the chat. There we go. Okay, who's next? Uh, Jackie, you're next. <clears throat> Thank you, dear Islam Samati and friends. I rejoice that we have the Dharma to be able to help us through in any circumstance, whereas before I would have been lost to be able to handle the things that I'm looking to help with my family right now, to step in, to get into the dirt, whatever it takes, just being there and doing what we need to help others in any circumstance and having the bravery 
the kindness and taking others through our journey with, with care and love. Thank you. Yes, the Dharma <clears throat> has certainly provided me with the ability to cope with my illness. And uh, I don't have many other problems in life, but um, being able to cope with the illness has been an extraordinary benefit of the Dharma. So we shouldn't, uh, shouldn't forget how important it is to practice 24 seven, not just on our cushion. <clears throat> Okay, let's see who's next. Evgeny. Да, я бы хотел сегодня порадоваться тому, что я записываю это занятие. Yes, today I would like to suggest that I am uh, recording this class because uh, before there were seeds of disconnection and the uh, I want to uh, change it and uh, make it uh, po make it possible for people that they uh, can understand uh, wisdom and understand Dharma. And the way to do that is to help other people <clears throat> like you're doing. That's what's setting the seeds for you to see that all the help you need whether it be for the Dharma or other things in the future. So rejoicing with, with wisdom is what we're after here. Um, so, okay, last but not least, Katya and Sheila. Katya, you're up. Okay, hi, hello. Um, I rejoice that I helped you in to with his, with his, with, with her bike training, she's she's going to do an Ironman, and she was going to ride alone, um, to ride alone in in on Saturday, and I decide to go with her, and and we ride together. The, the Ironman. Yeah, she's gonna do the Ironman, and she's training. Wow. Alone, so so I'm gonna help her with with her with his training. Wow. My high school girlfriend's brother was David Scott, and he was one of the first um, winners of the uh, Ironman competition way back in the beginning. David so Scott? David Scott. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, he's really a, a, good, a, a competitive person. Yes. Yes, I, he went to high, I went to high school with him and his sister. Uh, so, he won, was, won the Ironman Championship, right? He was. I think he was the first yes. winner. Yes, yes. Wow. Yeah, he's very, uh, very competitive young yeah. man. He's not so young anymore, actually. No. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, his sister was my first uh, serious girlfriend. <laughs> Maybe someday I'll show you a picture of myself and her going to the prom. Yes, it was nice. Okay. Thank Sheila, you. what do you have to rejoice in? I rejoice that uh, I have been very careful with the way that I speak, and I have been stopped saying uh, things that can hurt uh, the other person or negative things. And, and I'm very happy because of that. Very good. The important, like I just said, the important thing is rejoicing with wisdom because, I mean, just rejoicing is great, but rejoicing knowing that what you're doing is setting the seeds for your future uh, in enlightenment is, is very powerful. So always add the at the end that you're rejoicing. Well, for instance, in uh, in helping this person with uh, their exercise regimen, you that'll give you the karma to get help in whatever you want to do, not just physical activity, 
it's my belief if you rejoice in generosity, the generosity can come back as a financial or food or um, studying. Um, yeah. Okay, what am I rejoicing in? Hmm. I'm rejoicing in my having patience. Um, and that'll help me get what I need in the future. I We had trouble with the internet. I had to put a new router, a new modem uh, on my internet system. And you'd think in this day and age that that would be very straightforward and simple. It took me two hours to get my computer connected to this new modem. And then my wife, uh, luckily, the night before her class, we uh, tried to hook her up to the new modem. And it took me four hours of work with a technician to try and get that to work because I had to use my phone uh, to connect with the technician since I had to have the router on to try and fix it. And because of Parkinson's, it's very hard for me to, it's very slow for me to type on my phone. So it took a lot longer than I thought it would, but we got it fixed. And when my wife woke up, it was all working perfectly for her. And, and that's setting the karma for me to have people help me fix things when I need it. So <clears throat> it was frustrating. I didn't get mad at anybody. I realized it was my karma ripening for not helping any, uh, not being careful on what I did, what I was doing. And that's what resulted in the problems with the modem. So, so that's my rejoicing. Okay. Um, today's class is going to be a lot about emptiness. <clears throat> And it's a little bit confusing because Geshe is having a, an imagined conversation with someone from another planet. So I'm going to go through it slowly, and we're hopefully going to be able to uh, figure this out. So what we're doing now, we're still studying step by step how to attain enlightenment to become a being who can truly help all others. People on other worlds have figured it out. People on this world have mostly not figured it out because we still see hunger and war here. If we practice what we're what Geshe Michael's teaching us in these long rim teachings, we study it well, we practice it well, we meditate on the steps, we should, we could, we should reach a place where we can be someone who can help this entire world escape all the pain we see. Now, we can't take their pain away, but we can teach them how to, they can take their pain away. And it's very important to remember that. I can't take your pain away. All I can do is teach you how, to, how you can take your pain away. And when I say all I can do is teach you, that's a massive responsibility and power that each of us will have as we teach. And we need to remember not to um, take that for granted. So if we want to have help the world escape all the pain and suffering, we have to understand emptiness, period. That's the first step. So each of the other steps will be informed by emptiness. Pabunka Rinpoche was discussing the kind of conditions we need to help us see emptiness. He listed a few. First, we have to have a living teacher. It's not enough to read things on the internet or in books. We need a living teacher who's had some experience of emptiness and has also had some familiarity with the scriptures that teach it. Now, I don't have a personal experience with emptiness. I wish I did, but I don't. So all of what I'm teaching you in these courses, these classes, is coming from Geshe Michael. So I just want you to remember that. I don't have a personal experience of emptiness. 
We need to do great things for extraordinary people to set the karma, gain the virtue and merit that we need to see emptiness directly. So you should find special people and help them. Uh, he says, do errands for them, etc. Remove the obstacles in your life. Uh, you don't know who's an extraordinary person. Uh, obviously, your spouse, uh, good friends, your parents, siblings, fellow Dharma students, uh, obviously, Geshe Michael. The important thing, but I like to look at it this way. You don't know who an angel is. You don't know who a special person is, just like we don't know who a bodhisattva is necessarily. So we need to be polite and kind and generous to everyone. So... Well, here's an example. If someone is irritating you and is not listening to you, then you have to see who you're not listening to and change it. In other words, if someone's not listening to you or irritating you, it's because you were irritating someone in the past. So it's, it's oh, how can I put this? It's important to, to remember at the moment, if someone's irritating you, that it's easy to think you don't deserve it because you're a nice person. Let's say you're a nice person now and you don't irritate people. So when someone irritates you, your first thought is, well, that's, this isn't fair. I don't irritate people. Well, it's like my saying, I don't get angry anymore. Just this morning, I got angry again at myself for having trouble putting on my uh, compression socks. I got mad. I tried very hard not to, but it, I get frustrated and I get mad. So I could say it's not fair. Um, I don't usually get mad anymore. So why am I getting mad? It's somebody else's fault. Well, I'm getting mad because I got mad in the past and it's ripening now for me to get mad again. What I need to do is stop getting mad in the present so in the future, I don't see mad people around me or am I getting mad? But it's, it's important for me not to think and this isn't, there's no correlation between uh, my getting mad now and getting mad in the past. Whatever happens now is because of my actions in the past. Whatever I do now in response is what's going to be important for the future. That's a critical, very critical thing to remember constantly throughout the day. Very critical. So... You need to ask your heart lama, your root lama, uh, for help. You can do it directly if you can contact them directly, or you can do it in your mind all day. You should talk to your teacher. You could say something like, I'm asking you directly in my words and heart to guide me all my life, especially in the deep teachings of emptiness. You gather together the conditions which will be good for understanding, the understanding and the teachings to come, conditions which are conducive, which will help you cultivate the result. So ask your heart teacher, ask your Lama for guidance. They're like fertilizer or water or sunlight for a plant. If you don't have the conditions, you'll never understand emptiness. If you don't have a living teacher, you won't get understanding emptiness. If you don't make good karma with with powerful objects, you won't get you won't understand emptiness. If you don't clean away your own problems, um, you won't get emptiness. How do you know you have a problem? 
if something unpleasant happens, you have a problem. So what you what you do about it, your immediate response, you just, your immediate response has to be to match it. So if people are lying to you, you stop lying. And that, that includes small white lies. Did we talk about white lies? Okay. White lie is a, you tell a lie like, let's see, you think it's not going to harm anybody. So someone asked me how many students are t taking the long rim class. And I say, oh, 30 or 40. Well, I'm pretty sure it's not 30 or 40. I don't know how many it is, both including the Russian students. But instead I say, well, I'm teaching to one, two, three, four, five, six uh, people. So I'm teaching to six people uh, via Zoom. And then I'm not sure how many Russian students are taking it uh, later on when they replay it. And you think to yourself, so big deal. I say 30 or 40 people. It doesn't really matter. It's a lie. I told it purposely to impress. And that's going to come back to me as someone giving me information to impress me that isn't true. So it's, I think white lies are something we say, it's my karma, but it's okay if I tell a white lie. Now, I've had discussions with students about sometimes being completely honest can be hurtful. And I think that's, well, let's see, what's an example? Um, being completely honest, being hurtful. Oh, early in my Dharma career with ACI, when Geshe Michael had started a three-year retreat, we had a teaching, a quiet retreat teaching, and I was asked, as one of the attendees, I was asked my opinion on how the, the team had supported him during this, this teaching, and I was asked my opinion, so I gave it. And what I did was I didn't tell any white lies. I told them what was wrong with the presentation of my opinion. Well, that was hurtful. They uh, they didn't like, they just come out of doing this teaching. They thought it went perfectly. And here's someone telling them it didn't. Now, if I told them it had been okay and lied about it, because I didn't think it was okay, that wasn't right. But what I did was hurtful. So what I should have done and did in the future was start off my critique by saying, it was really a wonderful teaching, you did a wonderful job. And then say, here are some things that you might consider changing. So I praise them first and then give them my critique. Now, if they can't handle the, the critique, that's because, and here's the important part, it's not because they didn't want to handle the, re the critique. My karma ripening for them to not handle the information was by my saying something wrong to somebody else in the past. And that's ripening now for me to say this and have them not understand it. So it's important to correlate what's happening now that you don't like with how you did something in the past to make that karma ripen in the future, your present. So it's really, really important. For instance, my modem problem. I did something in the past that to stop people from communicating well. Now, they didn't have modems probably in my past lifetime. So how could I have done that with a modem? Well, that's it's not a one-to-one -one correlation. I don't need it to be a problem with a modem to be something in the past. It's I need it to be something somehow I didn't communicate 
properly. Let's say it was a, oh, how would I have communicated? Well, let's say in the past I was taking dictation and I was careless with it. And I took, I took dictation from someone and what I took down was not an accurate representation of what they said, but I didn't care about it because I really didn't want to do the dictation anyway. So that set the seeds for in a future like, instance that I would not get accurate information from somebody else. And that's what happened with the modem. I kept getting this conflicting information and the person wasn't being very helpful. So was the person not being very helpful or was it my karma ripening from not being helpful in the past? It's the latter. It's my karma ripening for not being helpful in the past. So I guess the, the point of this is really look, first of all, when something, you have a problem, think about how you could have caused that in the, someone a problem in the past and how it's ripening in the future. It's not someone else's fault. It is your fault for an action you took in a past life or earlier in this life. So back to white lies. A white lie, no matter how you phrase it, in my opinion, is a lie. An exaggeration is by definition a lie. You're talking about something that didn't happen in order to impress somebody else. So in terms of a white lie, just don't, don't lie. So how do you how do you solve that problem? Well, as you're speaking, think whether you're exaggerating, think whether you're trying to make someone else feel good by telling them something that's not true. And if you are, that's a lie. And no matter how small, no matter how seemingly inconsequential, you have to stop telling the lie in order to not have people lie to you in the future. It's, it's just that simple. You don't want someone to get angry at you. Don't get angry yourself in the past and that'll ripen as you're not getting angry in the future. Don't respond to anger with anger because that's setting the seed to have anger again in your future. It's hard. It takes constant remembrance and vigilance, but I think you'll find if you start doing it very consciously, uh, things will get better. You'll have less argument, less problems in your in your life. Will you become independently wealthy? Maybe, but that wealth is going to come from having given uh, your wealth away, being generous with money. That seems uh, oxymoronic. If you want more money, you give it away? No, you accumulate it, you hoard it. Well, that's absolutely wrong. You don't hoard it, you, you give it away. Now, do you give all your money away? You give that which you can give without having regret. So white lies. I tell you what, for next class, for Friday, I'd like each of you to monitor what you're saying during the week, the rest of the week, and see if you can catch yourself telling a white lie, doing an exaggeration. It's... The point of the exercise is to not to uh, blame yourself, not to embarrass you by telling us what the white lie was. The point of the exercise is to catch yourself. You'll be surprised. I think you'll be surprised at um, 
you you tell more white lies or you exaggerate more often than you think. And the point of the exercise is to catch, begin to catch yourself with that particular mental affliction and, and break the habit. Now I find myself now when I'm talking, I, I find myself going, is this true? Is this true? Are you exaggerating? Is this a white lie? While I'm talking. And that uh, that makes me understand how prevalent it was in, before I started trying not to tell white lies, just how uh, how often I did or exaggerate. So, well, for instance, when someone asked me about one of my books, um, my my last book, you know, how big is it? Well, it's not very big. How many pages? I could say it's around 200, or I could say it's 300, trying to impress them, when it's really 220. If I know the number, just say the number. It's 220 pages long. If that's impressive to somebody, great. If it isn't, that's great too. Okay, let's move on. There came to be four great schools, four great conditions from ancient India to explain emptiness. We're going to be going into that in much greater detail later. There are many versions of emptiness taught by Lord Buddha himself. These were given to different levels, audience, different audiences with different capacities, lesser, medium, or greater capacities. Hinayana, Mahayana, mind-only, detailists, Svatantrikas, Majjhimika Prasangika, all these different versions of emptiness, depending on the audience. And it's course 15 is about what the what Lord Buddha really meant. If you get a teaching that seems to contradict what he said, um, understand that he's teaching, this particular teaching that you're listening to is a different uh, capacity audience. I remember being at a teaching he gave in the University of Arizona. We were sitting there, he's giving a teaching on emptiness and he could see that he was losing the audience. There were about 30 people at this meeting. And so he stopped completely and went into a very popular meditation that he, he was pretty sure all these people would enjoy. So the reason I say I mention that is you need to be flexible on what you're teaching. If he'd continued teaching, he would have set the seeds for boring an audience and possibly having the audience not want to be involved in Buddhism anymore. So he had to change what he was teaching in order to prevent that. So instead of teaching material that would be uh, boring to other Dharma students, he changed it into making it something interesting. Now, was it boring for its own side? No. Was it boring to them? Yes. Could I? Could he have taught, or if in, my, in this situation, could I have taught differently? Yes. So you see, taking something as simple as a teaching to an audience that's not appreciating it is a very good example of how you have to be vigilant and monitoring what you're doing and the response of the, the people you're trying to teach. It sounds complicated, it really isn't. Um, you get a feeling pretty quickly in a live audience uh, how interested they are. Okay. So Keshe Michael now goes into this conversation with a being from another planet about aspirin. 
So just listen carefully, and I'll see if I can explain this clearly to you. So this is the pen all over again, but it's aspirin instead. So what's this? This is a bottle of aspirin. It's actually ibuprofen, which isn't aspirin. It's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. The active ingredient is acetaminophen. Okay, I digress. So this is a bottle of aspirin. Now, Keshe Michael says he's going to have a conversation with a gentleman from another planet. So Keshe Michael asks, what is this thing? It's aspirin. And Kish Michael in another voice says, I'm from another planet, planet B. You live on planet A. We've been studying you guys. This thing where you start looking bad and pale and you take this thing called aspirin, right? It's a medicine. What's a medicine? A medicine is something that takes away illness but you have to take it. You swallow the medicine and it takes away pain. Does this particular, what does this particular medicine do? They use it normally for headaches. You take an aspirin and the headache goes away. And we say the aspirin works. And Gishen Michaels, uh, the guy from another planet says, does it always work? No. So on your planet, when you, you're in pain, you take the pill and you wait. Why do you wait? To see if it will kick in. Let me get this straight. This is the person from another planet. You take a medicine that by definition takes away your problem, and you wait to see if it will work or not work? When it doesn't work, is it a medicine? Medicine is something that takes away our pain. If it doesn't work as a medicine, I don't think you can say that. When you take the aspirin, it doesn't work. Are there different chemicals in the aspirin that weren't there in the past? Now, that's a inter very interesting question because it's quite possible that the medicine didn't work because it's missing an ingredient. But that's not the point. The point we're talking about is the fact that this bottle of ibuprofen, I'm supposed to take two, three times a day for to control my headache. Now, the emptiness of aspirin is twofold. One, taking aspirin doesn't necessarily take care of your headache. And we'll discuss that in a minute. Taking this particular type of aspirin. I lost my train of thought. Hang on a minute. No, I lost my train of thought. So when we take the aspirin, the headache goes away. We say the aspirin works. Does it always work? No. So you take the pill and wait. Why do we wait? To see if the aspirin works. So the guy from another planet says, let me get this straight. You take a medicine that by definition takes away your problem and you wait to see if it will work or not. When it doesn't work, is it an ass? Is it a medicine? Well, that's a good question. When you take the aspirin and it doesn't work, are there different kinds of chemicals in the aspirin that won't let them do the won't let it work? No, that's not true. It's the same chemical makeup. So the guy from another planet says, this doesn't make any sense. If it's the same chemical makeup, it should work all the time. Why doesn't it work? 
And the guy from our plant says, that's what I don't understand. It should work all the time. So what's going on? Your karma needs an agent to make the pain go away. This is the how and the why. The how and the why. How I took, how I got rid of the pain from my headache or how I got rid of the blood clotting problem I have is I took a, a pill that could, should, and, uh, and should take care of my blood clotting problem. But it's, it may not. So for somebody else, it could not work. So what is it, what happened to make that active ingredient work in the Zeralto pill I take for blood, and stopping my blood from clotting? It's helping others, helping others, giving them, uh, making sure they got the medicine they need. That would be a direct correlation. Um, helping someone with their groceries uh, in another life could ripen and as someone helping, as my pill working. So you need to activate it. You need to have the karma to make the, the pill work. It's not that the pill doesn't have the uh, acetaminophen in it. It does. It's the fact that we haven't activated the pill by not taking care of others or hoping others get the, the medicine they need. So in three-year retreat, my wife had these terrible migraine headaches. <clears throat> and one of the other students in retreat <clears throat> bought my wife <clears throat> her medicine because Vimla wanted the karma for having helped my wife, a powerful karmic object for, for Vimla. She wanted the medicine to work for her because she got headaches as well. And the way she assured the medicine working for her was to make sure that somebody else had the medicine they needed. That's what, what activated the medicine for Vimla. So how did it work? It had a, a chemical in it that prevents migraine. Why it worked, why it worked was because of her giving someone medicine in the, and she giving my wife medicine now made it ripen for her to work for her because she considered my wife to be a powerful karmic object. And that's the key. If you think the person's a powerful karmic object, they are for you a powerful karmic object. So by thinking, by doing that for my wife, Vimla was setting the conditions for that particular medicine called sumatriptan to work for her. Now she could have just paid for the medicine and given it to my wife and left it at that. That would have been nice. It might have helped. But by her saying, I'm giving you this medicine because I need to set the seeds in the future for the medicine to work for me. That's doing it with wisdom. So the argument, the question Geshe is bandying about with the uh, person from another planet is that most of us don't know the how and the why or the past, the present, and the future analysis. And because of that, we see the world in pain and in suffering So, Keshe Michael says here, the gentleman from another planet, 
Did I say that aspirins never work? No, I didn't say that. Could they work? Yes. Do they always work now? Well, for the time being, yes. If you get this, you get the rest of the book. Middle way says there's a cause beneath the cause, which is kindness and serving. Then it will always work. I didn't say aspirin didn't work or did work. If you're kind, the aspirin will work. It'll take that pain away. There's a very unique teaching of the Middle Way School. What we've been talking about is something called dependent origination. It just means that things work because of kindness. Things work when you've been kind. If you put a seed in your mind for aspirin to work by being kind to someone else, then aspirin will work. Take all the asthma in the world that works because you've, not because you've been kind. How much would you have? None. It's important to, to uh, repeat that. Take all the asthma in the world that work. Now, excuse me. If you put a seed in your mind for asthma to work by being kind to someone with a headache, the asthma will work. Take away all the asthma in the world that works not because you've been kind and you won't be able to find any. Let me repeat that. Take all away all the aspirin in the world that would work not because you've been kind and how much would you have? None. There is no self-existent ingredient in aspirin that takes away your headache because if there was, Everybody taking aspirin would have to have the headache go away. And that's not true. So you need to activate the actual active ingredient, the why of the how and why. I can't emphasize enough how important that is throughout your day, thinking of the how and the why, and how that's how you're reacting. If you understand how and why, you understand dependent origination, then it's very easy to accept what's happening to you. Well, maybe I shouldn't say very easy, but it allows you the opportunity to investigate and in ex accepting what has happened to you. I keep coming back to my illness. If I think it's not fair for me to have Parkinson's and, and get mad about it, and I'm denying my, my knowledge of karma and emptiness, I'm denying my knowledge of dependent origination. It's as if you say, if you say it's my karma, but what you're basically saying is you don't believe that the, the why is important. Let me repeat that. If you say it's my karma, but you're basically denying that karma is the cause for your problem, even though you've acknowledged it, you said, but it isn't. So it's like, well, here's an analogy, oh, a little bit different. Uh, giving an apology. So how many times have you heard the phrase, uh, no if, ands, or buts? So with uh, an apology, you don't say, I apologize, and I hope it didn't hurt your feelings. You don't say, I apologize, if it hurt your feelings. You don't say, I apologize, but I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. You apologize by simply saying, I'm sorry. And if you believe it won't happen again, say it won't happen again. Mm 
because if you say it's my karma, I'm, I apologize. But I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. Well, you should have thought, the thought of that before you said what hurt their feelings. So catch yourself saying it's my karma, but, and stop it. Because you know through the how and the why, the dependent origination, that there's no such thing as my karma, but it doesn't matter. Dependent origination is emptiness. The meaning of dependent origination, the meaning of emptiness is dependent origination. They, there are two sides of the same coin. You've heard that many a time in the ACI courses. What that means is if you're going to teach emptiness, you need to teach dependent origination. If you're going to teach dependent origination, you need to take, teach emptiness. And this is where it gets a little bit tricky, depending on what school you're in and what level of, of uh, understanding you have. He changed his teachings in the first, second, and third turns of the wheel to match the capacity of his audience. He wasn't saying they were stupid, he wasn't saying they were dim-witted. He just said, this is the load that you can carry in terms of the thought process for seeing emptiness directly. The meaning of, in, of emptiness is dependent origination. The compassionate teacher, Lord Buddha, came to address audiences of many different types of students. You have to be sensitive to that. So one of the questions asked, if you don't have any control over my body and mind, how do I create better karma? Well, when you say you don't have any control over the present, you do have control over the future. The karma that ripens in the present has pretty much nothing you can do about it. And that's a, the pervasive suffering. In my mind, the pervasive suffering is not only are you dying the minute you're born, but the minute you're born, you have karma starting to ripen. So if you don't have any control over your body, how can I create better karma? We didn't say you don't have control. I mean you don't have control over the present, but you do have control over the future. So take advantage of that fact and make sure in this life you're doing the highest karmic deeds you can to support the people in your life to support the city or country. So, like I said, Lord Buddha taught the concept of dependent origination to several different levels of students. It was important to keep the students, oh, to start them on their path with emptiness and dependent origination. So we don't get into the details of that until we get to course 15. I'll try and add some of that into these lectures because I think it's quite timely.
So now we're going to talk about things existing and things that don't exist in more specific detail. We had this, Lord Buddha taught the three different turnings of the wheel, which had three different levels of dependent origination and emptiness teaching within them. People kept coming and clarifying for future generations that the three turnings of the wheel. Master Khan Chandra Kirti came in 650 AD and he taught emptiness, independent origination. And it confused people. So those are very deep and difficult teachings on emptiness. So as we start our emptiness education, it's very important that if someone teaches you, gives you a teaching on emptiness that doesn't apply to your life and doesn't help you be kind to others, it's not useful and it's wrong. It's like saying emptiness is a color. Emptiness is not a color. So if someone's teaching you emptiness is a color blue, you sit and meditate on the color blue to reach emptiness directly. That teaching's wrong, and you shouldn't pursue it any further. So this is a famous statement by uh, Chan Khan, Khandra Kirti in uh, 650 AD. This is what he said. If someone were to go away on a path and diverge from the teaching of Nagarjuna and lose the ideas of aspirin is not aspirin, it's not not aspirin, how it works through kindness. Emptiness can only be understood in the context of compassion. Someone who leaves that tradition will never reach happiness or peace. So you say, how can kindness help with understanding emptiness? It's a matter of accumulating enough merit through doing virtuous deeds to set the seeds that you'll see emptiness. You'll understand dependent origination and see emptiness directly. Now, how does that correlate? Well, that's I've been saying all along. It's very important not to take a karmic deed and saying that it correlates one to one. If you're generous for just somebody else, it doesn't mean, well, let me rephrase that. If you're generous for somebody else, let's say you, you uh, help them with their homework for ACI course three, you go out of your way to help them now, and you dedicate it. Well, that, how, what could that ripen at? You've gone out of your way, you've been generous with them. It could ripen as money. It could ripen as someone helping you with teachings in the future. So there's, just because you help someone study, doesn't mean that generosity couldn't, uh, ripen as you're getting all the money you need because generosity covers both instances. So it's very important to understand this lack of a one-to-one -one correlation. I'm trying to think of another one. No, there was a retreat, there is a retreat center in California called Vajrapani Institute. And 
they had a really nasty road going up this creek, kind of narrow canyon, like, well, it wasn't a canyon, but it was a bad road. And they asked Geshe Michael, what do we need to do to get this road improved? We don't have the money to uh, put in a new road, to surface it with asphalt. And he said the karma correlation for ill will and gossip and arguing is you'll live in an area with rough roads and it's difficult to travel. So he recommended they all get together as a group and start practicing Tonglen and trying to set the seeds for the road to be straightened out, uh, improved. A short time after, a county representative came up and said, I've got some extra asphalt that's just going to go to waste. Can I work on any part of your road that you want? They were aware we needed better pavement The county was. So what happened was the uh, people of Ajapani started watching their speech. They started watching their interaction with each other, not being argumentative, supporting each other's decisions. And several months later, the county came and repaved their road. Now, how did that happen? Why did that happen? Because just being not uh, arguing with people, how did that manifest in having a nice road? Well, by not arguing with people, you're setting the seeds for you to have things happen for you without having to argue with them about it. So you didn't, they didn't go to the county and say, we need more asphalt, we need our road to be improved. Instead, they, they went in another route and they said, we're going to stop sowing the seeds, karmic seeds, for rough roads and discord in our community. And by doing that, we're going to set the seeds maybe to have the road improved. Now, maybe what would have happened was someone would have donated $100,000 to uh, improve the road. That that could have happened. But instead of it being money, it was because of their kindness toward each other. And that they knew that that would karmically correlate into something pleasant, which was the road being formed. There's a bunch of karma correlations that we get to in the ACI courses. It's a couple of pages that says, you do this, you get that. And that's an important class. But it's easy to fall into the trap that it has to be one-to-one. -one. If I cook for someone, then someone's going to cook for me in the future. Well, that could be. But if you're taking care of someone by cooking for them, maybe in the future what happens is they don't get sick. So you've, you've helped them, not by feeding them, but because you helped them in the past, you're generating the karma to see them in the future get what they need. So if I want to not have Parkinson's in the future and maybe have it go away in the present, I need to help others. I need to be more considerate of others. I not I need to not inconvenience them. So how does that correlate with not getting sick with Parkinson's? My trouble with Parkinson's is it's it's difficult to do things. It's frustrating. So if I take away frustrating other people and I and I take away being impatient that can ripen as not being impatient and, and helping other people. 
And that's what's going to ripen for me not to have Parkinson's. It's not, well, the medicine I take to um, lessen the symptoms is only working because in the past I helped somebody else with a problem they had. It doesn't have to be medicine. It doesn't have to be medical. It's the idea that you help someone and serve someone, and that will come back as service to you and help for you. You have to understand and believe that, or everything we're talking about in these lectures is pointless. Dependent origination and emptiness. The two work as side to side on the same same side of the, of a coin. Without one, you can't have the other. What else did I want to say? Oh. Here's a good example. I'd forgotten about this. So we're at Diamond Mountain. I'm getting these teachings on karma and emptiness, movement of the mind, lies. And I right away, I order a copy of the soundtrack to V for Vendetta. The $5.40, no big deal. I get the CD and on it it says, do not duplicate or not for resale. Well, I bought it. I could keep it. I emailed the guy and said, this is it's not for resale. And he said, well, send it back and I'll give you your money back. And I thought to myself, if I send it back, he's going to sell it to somebody else, even though it clearly says not for resale. So I said, no, thanks. I'm just going to keep it and destroy it. You don't have to send the money back. So I did. I took it and destroyed it because I knew that if I didn't, I was promulgating, I was supporting this gentleman's uh, incorrect view of how to sell things. Now, how did that ripen in the future? I'm not sure. Did it ripen in this life? I don't know. But what's going to happen when it does ripen is I didn't lie. I didn't take advantage of someone. I held to my moral compass. And that will mean in the future something happens for me that's very positive along uh, my, my moral, my ethics. So that's setting the seed. That's an example of setting the seed. Not knowing what's going to happen in the future, only knowing that it's a positive, good deed that I did, and I dedicate it. And that means it will ripen in the future. The alternative would be to keep it and play it, even though I told them, it was inappropriate for me to have it. So I destroyed it. That's thinking through a karma ripening, a karma consequence and dependent origination. What else do I have here? Okay, that's pretty much all I wanted to talk about today. It's a difficult subject to wrap your mind around, and we're going to attack it from a variety of different ways. But the important thing is to remember 
dependent origination, karma, karma and emptiness are two sides of the same coin. You can't have one without the other. Yeah, that's all I wanted to say. So we'll go back on the meditation uh, next class. And we're going to we're going to attack emptiness from a variety of different viewpoints to try and find one that works the best for you. Are you going to understand emptiness perfectly after this class? This these ten classes, maybe. But I'm trying to set the seed for you to be interested in trying to pursue the understanding of emptiness and develop your meditation skills so you can apply your understanding of emptiness in your meditation to reach your ultimate goal. So hang in there. I remember the first time we were introduced, well, the first time I heard anything about karma and emptiness was Geshe Michael came to Tucson and gave a teaching on a diamond cutter. And between the diamond cutter and the course 13 on logic, those are probably the two hardest courses to take from Geshe Michael. We didn't know him from Adam. What we'd seen was um, a flyer that said a, a American monk was coming to give a course on the Diamond Cutter Sutra. And we thought to ourselves, an American monk, good, it'll be in English, perfect. So we went and he started teaching the Diamond Cutter. And I remember he'd ask these questions, is this like, is this real or not? And I'd say, it's real. And he'd go, no, it's not real. I go, darn it. I thought I understood this. And then he says, is, he says it again in a different way. And he says, is this real? And I go, no, it isn't. He goes, yes, it is. And I'm sitting there going, I can't get this right. But I didn't give up. I decided that this had, that this teaching on karma and emptiness made the world make much more sense and I was going to stick it out, even if I couldn't get the answers right. And I did. And I helped him get into three-year retreat. And I got my chance at three-year retreat. And I'm still getting these wonderful teachings from him. So, so hang in there. Study hard. Now, and don't forget, I want you to think of a white lie. And don't be embarrassed. The point is not to, to admonish you. I'm trying to get you to see just how prevalent. Now, maybe in your life it's not prevalent. Maybe you, that is a, a, an affliction you have. And in which case, wonderful. But by looking for it and seeing if you tell a lot of them, then you know that you've got that to work on. And that's why people, if you aren't getting help from other people, it's because you were telling lies, even white lies in the past. Okay, let's dedicate this class. This class is a little confusing, a little rambling. Now I apologize for that. A teaching depends on origination and emptiness is a difficult subject. Okay. May, may we ask a question, please? Sure. Thank you. That's okay. Thank you very much for that space. And so with white lies, I have an example where someone asks, how are you? And maybe you've just had some interactions with others where you see that others are in, you're feeling that distress from them, that you're seeing them in distress, but then you you kind of want to be gentle and you don't always want to expose that sort of thing. So you might say, yeah, I'm okay. But of course we know that in the next moment we can move on from how we saw that experience. But I guess that's a white light, you know, if you're 
you've just experienced something like that and um, you're taking on someone else's suffering, but then you want to keep smiling through it. Well, thank you, Jackie. That's an excellent, excellent example of what a, of a white lie. I really, I had forgotten that I use that and sometimes when I teach. So thank you. It's that's a very good example. So you ref, the ref, reflexive response to someone saying, "How are you?" I'm fine. How are you? When you ask somebody how they are, are you really expecting to hear how they really are? No, you're expecting them to say, oh, I'm okay. So when someone asks me now, how are you? I say, well, uh, my symptoms seem to be stable. Uh, my balance is not is getting a slightly worse, but I'm not too worried about it. Instead of saying, oh, I'm okay, because I'm not okay. So I'm telling a white lie so that they don't get hurt. And at the same time, it doesn't mean I have to launch into a long list of what's wrong with me. But, but realize when, if you ask somebody how they are, you have to listen to them describe what's wrong. It doesn't mean don't ask, just be willing to listen. But that's that's really a good example. I'm trying to think of another one like that. Well, if I ask you, you come in my house and I make a typical meal, and I ask you, did you like dinner? By asking that question, I have to be ready to receive a negative answer. No, I like uh, I like to have my potatoes on the side of the plate, um, my vegetables on another part of the plate, and maybe bread as the third item. Well, when I cook, I cook what we call Stump stuff, my last name Stump. We call it stump stuff. It's usually a bunch of stuff all put in one container. It's like a stew. And that's just because we don't, we'll have a salad on the side. Now, where am I going with that? So, so, if I ask somebody if they liked it, I've got to listen carefully and be ready to accept the fact that they, they may not have. If I'm approached, if I liked a meal, uh, let's say at a restaurant, how'd you like what you had at the restaurant? You can say, oh, it was great, even though I didn't like it, because you don't want to hurt the feelings of the person who paid for it. Or you can say, well, it's not what I expected. It was still pretty good, but it's not what I expected. That's being truthful, not telling the white lie of, oh, it was great. And it seems inconsequential for a meal, but there's nothing inconsequential for karma, for setting a karmic seed that's going to ripen into something you don't want. I just can't, that's why I want you to, to look and see where you might have white lies appearing in your day-to-day your -day life. This is a, sorry. No, that was, that's a good example. Yes, you had another question? Yes, please, if that's okay. And I hope that yeah. others are having an opportunity as well, but I thank you. Um, if you are in a situation where you are finding that you need to support others to sell things and step in with and to try and honor the price that they would like things to be sold at, in they, they have this concept where you people have these games that they play where they bluff that they want to try and get the highest price 
but you want the honesty about the whole situation. So, you know, maybe previously it might be normal where people might say, oh, someone else has already bid $20 when it hasn't even happened because it creates this excitement. I'm not saying I've done any of that, but it's some things that can happen when you're trying to sell things. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious to see um, how you would sort of, you know, keep the honesty and the, the truth of the situation and selling things and trying to honour the price that others want things to be sold at um, and also trying to inspire interest and excitement to help people to keep seeing that the, that it's worth value and that they can aim for a little higher than what they might initially offer. Uh, that's <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting dilemma. I think... We have lots of yard sales around this community because people, there are estate sales. People pass away or they're moving, they want to get rid of stuff. So they put it out in the yard sale with little price tags. And whenever I put something out like that, I often just say, what do you think it's worth? And let them establish the price. Now you're gonna run it. You're gonna run up to run across people that that say, "Oh, it's only worth ten dollars," when you know it's worth twenty. Like you're saying, Jackie. Yeah. Well, it's important to realize where that's coming from. That's coming from your past misdeed to try and get something cheaper than than what you should. That's ripening with this person trying to get something uh, at a price they want, um, not the price you want. So, so in the present moment, if you if you go to a yard sale and there's something there for ten dollars that you think is only worth five, you have to honor that person's um, that the price that person gave. And that's setting the karma for you to get the people to agree to buy, to pay what you think it's worth. So the reason someone's not doing that is because you did something similar in the past. So it's not like, well, that's, I'm, I wish these people would, would just pay what I'm asking for and not argue with me. Well, that's coming from your past deeds. Knowing that, you just simply say, okay, uh, I think it's worth more, but I'll take I'll take that amount. Mm -hmm. It's it's hard to do because you want to get if you're selling stuff like this, you want to get the money you need for whatever next project you've got or help with paying rent or something like that. But remember where it's coming from, remembering you want to make it not happen in the future. So by not arguing with them about the price and what they're willing to pay, you're setting the seeds in the future for you to get the very things that you want uh, because you didn't argue with them. It's hard, it's our, our tendency is to try and protect our thought, our need at the expense of somebody else. And that's what we're trying to to change that attitude so that you can set the conditions for the future being what you want them to be and not being driven by ignorant, um, setting seeds ignorantly. Any other questions? Uh, yes, thank you, Vamos Martin. I have two questions. One is uh, that uh, I I understand uh, that you need to do something for other people to get uh, in the future for you to receive something like this, but I don't understand why so many people are helping other people and they're good people and they're not receiving, of course, there may be past karma from past lives, but then uh, we have all the seeds possible, all the possible karma that we have can collect from past lives. And 
uh, it kind of negates each other. So, uh, what, um, it is the same like with chemical aspirin not working. The karma looks like maybe it's not working for everybody and not working all the time, like giving doing something good. And, and the second question is, um, what do you think about, it's not, uh, what do you think about people who are in the, uh, following the teachings and they're just trying to, um, to do things with this understanding uh, oh I'm gonna give one dollar here and I'm gonna give one dollar there uh, because I want more money for me later and I want to uh, have like uh, a million dollars later so this for me personally it looks fake mm -hmm. uh, a little bit um and I try to do it and I have a lot of resistance myself. So I'm trying to understand for myself. Uh, and where um, it's my, so if you can help me with those two questions, it's not exactly what you've asked about the white lie, but it's relate, it relates to the, to the class earlier. Thank you. Well, this is a this is a constant struggle for most most people. Um, yeah, I can you well part of what you're talking about is judgment. Someone you know, how can I put this? I'm because it popped in my mind an example that you're talking about. Um, okay. If you're giving, there's a fine line between being generous and being generous with uh, the wrong motivation. So if you give money, if I give money to others, like I give, uh, we give money every month to ACI and we give money every month to Diamond Mountain Retreat Center. And we don't expect anything in return other than getting the teachings we need. But we don't do it, we don't give the money going, well, if we give money to Diamond Mountain you know, uh, Retreat Center, we're going to get a ton of money in the future. What we do is we say we're giving that money so that in the future we have access to the very things we need, which may be money, it may be to a retreat center, it may be to Geshe Michael's teachings. But we give it, well, maybe part of the trouble is you need to give money anonymously. We, for the most part, don't make a big deal about the money we give because the worst thing that can happen is, is you starting to compare. So you give, you give $5 um, and someone gives 40 and the minute they hear you've given only five or you've, you hear they've given 40, then you start making comparisons about should you have given more? Could you have given more? Based on how you you think you'll be judged. And that's that's giving with ignorance. Um, because the judgment's gonna come from you. It sounds like it's coming from somebody else. But the judgment's coming from you. You set the seeds in the past, judging others and their donations as being not enough or too much. And that's your judging somebody else instead of taking care of your own donations. I don't know if that answers your question, but... Oh. 
Yes, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And what was the other question? So the other one was uh, because we've lived many lives and we've accumulated karma, positive and negative karma. And uh, if uh, somebody is in the current life have been giving and helping others and uh, was nice person, but they still are um, not rich, like not uh, uh, not receiving back uh, what they have given. Uh, the the teachings will say it's from the past lives but in the past lives we all have positive and negative karma so for me doesn't add up a little bit um doesn't add adds up if a person is uh, being nice and they're not receiving oh okay yeah well that's the uh that's the fun part, in quotes, about karma. I have a very good friend who's been trying now for, since I've known her, from 2007. So what, 16, 17 years. She's been trying to get a spiritual partner, a boy, a, a boyfriend. Well, I guess it could be a girlfriend any day, these days. Okay, a spiritual partner. So she's been going to a uh, helping at a retirement community because Geshe said the way to meet your spiritual partner is to go help at a retirement community and help them uh, with day-to-day -day living. And she's been doing that for 17 years and she hasn't got a partner. And she's very frustrated. But That doesn't mean you give up. It means you continue to do that because you never know when that karma is going to ripen and you getting the partner you need or you desire. So, well, here's another example. You rob a bank. You have a lot of money. It seems like robbing the bank is what got you the money, but it isn't. What got you the money is generosity in the past, which happens to ripen after you've robbed the bank. So what's going to happen is you rob the bank, you have karma ripening for generosity, and you have all this money. But in the future, since you robbed the bank, someone's going to take that money from you. You potentially could have to take the money from you. So there's not a direct, a bad deed robbing a bank can't ripen as a good thing, getting money. It just, that's a law of karma that's in, inviolable. So if... You want to, let's see. If you're wishing, if you're generous now and you're not getting the response that you hope for, it's not because giving now is not working. It means giving now is going to work in the future, and what isn't working is what you did in the past. So that's why it's very important to keep the past as the present, the present as the future, on the tip of your tongue, thinking about that constantly during the day. What's happening now, I need to respond to with wisdom. So the fact that I get frustrated opening a Ziploc bag I know that if I want to have frustration in the future, the surest way to take care of that is getting frustrated now. The best thing I can do is every time I'm getting ready to be frustrated, I stop and I say to myself, stop it. That's movement of the mind. It's not the kind of karma you want. Stop it. 
So I'm getting used to, I get seven, seven or eight out of 10 episodes. I remember that. But then there's the one at the end of the day. And I think, darn, I just lost all that other good karma. So, so I think it's, don't look for the response right away. It may happen. But if it does, so we, this friend is, is thinking that she wants a good deed to ripen as a good result right away. And if you want that to happen, then you've got to accept the fact that the same thing's going to happen with the bad karma. That's going to ripen right away. And Geshe says, if you want bad karma ripen right away, and you accidentally step on a bug and crush it, if it's going to happen right away, you're going to get crushed right after you step on it. If you want, if you want the money to come from generosity right away, you've got to accept that something bad karma is going to ripen right away. And I don't think any of us want that. So you just have to put up with the fact that karma will ripen in this lifetime, in the next lifetime, or in any of the future lifetimes. And because of that, you need to be careful what your karma consequently, your movement of the mind is. And you need to be cognizant of how to have it happen, how to have it happen quickly. And the way for that is to do it toward a powerful karmic object. So if you want more money, give money to Geshe Michael. Be generous to Geshe Michael and say, I'm being generous to Geshe Michael because I know that in the future, if I want the funds I need to be able to study the Dharma, I need to help a very powerful comic object teach the Dharma. And you have to be willing to say, okay, in this lifetime, I may not see it. And I may not see it for the next several lifetimes. But that doesn't stop me from doing the deed the way I know how. With wisdom. I'm donating this money to Geshe Michael because I know in the future when I need money for a special project, I'm setting the seeds for that money to show up. So my friend is looking for a spiritual partner. She can either say, this isn't working, I give up. Or when she's helping someone at the old folks home, she says, I'm doing this so in the future I get the companionship that I want. Then she goes over and helps somebody else have lunch. And she says, I'm helping have this person have lunch because I want to know in the future that I'm going to have plenty of food uh, for my table. So that's the kind of thought process you have to have. If you're trying to help someone at an old folks home be appreciated and, uh, and happy, then you set the seeds, that's setting the seed for your future happiness. But you have to realize it's not going to necessarily happen as soon as you want. You don't give up because it's not happening. I'm not giving up hoping my Parkinson's goes away someday and I wake up without Parkinson. The fact that it hasn't happened over seven years doesn't get, discourage me in the slightest. I'm burning off vast amounts of karma for inconveniencing others. And 
someday that will all be burned off. I'm, I firmly believe that. So someday this young lady will find her spiritual partner if she doesn't give up and say this, this old karma and emptiness doesn't work. I give up. That's the surest way for her to not have it happen. Any other questions? Um, yes, please. Um, okay. Of course, when we see a situation, it's from what we experience, but we have a duty of care to look after others. And if we really truly think that others are in a situation that we need to help them with in some way, um, like I'll give you an example. It's incredibly personal, but where you see someone just piling to the sky, um, boxes, they're just piling them to the sky and it's not going to fit into the next place. And they know that, but they're, but they're spending hours trying to rearrange the boxes in the room, in the garage, when the previous garage was just so, it's like maybe twice as big or something like that. And then you can see in your mind that everything's just going to become a clutter of boxes around everywhere. And they are doing that because they're honouring someone's wishes, but knowing that it's not easy for them to do it. But you see them there for hours. So you start to come in there and see what you can do to help them at least. So you're not leaving them on their own to do it. But it's not, it's a it's a temporary thing, really. It needs to be like a longer term, how to actually address it, how to, you know, unpack things and um, be able to let go of things and help to make that difference. You can't just see and sit around and you keep trying to make little efforts, but how would you, what steps would you take to help that in that situation? Hmm. Well, this is going to sound kind of drastic, but my first thought would be to say, this is a fire hazard. Yeah, I thought that too. Yeah, this it is, is a fire hazard, period. Mom, dad, whatever, sister, brother, this is a fire hazard. I do not want you to have a, a fire, a problem with fire. So we need to get rid of half these boxes period. There's no discussion. We need to do that because it's a fire hazard. Now, you have to believe that. And then you have to, you have to just go ahead. And so, so mom, dad, whatever, um, half of these have to go. Now, I can come in and, and just take half the boxes or you can go through them one more time and you can select half the boxes to keep. And no, you can't have all of them. No, you can't have two thirds of them. You have to remove uh, half the boxes. And if they say, I can't do that, mm -hmm. that's, that's a dilemma. I don't have a good answer for that. If they yeah. can't. They can't do that, and that's what your problem is. You, they don't want to do it. Um, I think, Jackie, what I would do is I'm saying, if it's your mom, mom, I'm just doing it. Mm -hmm. You can, I'm sorry, I don't mean to get you upset, but we have to do this because it's a fire hazard, and I don't want you to have a fire and get hurt. Yeah. Well, Jackie, I don't agree. It's there's that's not true. These boxes aren't going to burn. Mm -hmm. Well, Mom, they could. You're right. They could not burn. But if they burn, that's a tremendous problem, and you need to anticipate that, and you need to get rid of these boxes. What you don't want to do is at night, go to get rid of them. <laughs> Just go in and take them all and say, what happened to my boxes? Oh, I got rid of them. That's, that's setting the seeds for someone to do that to you and not appreciate it. So what you're saying is in the past, you hoarded, you collected, 
irrespective of the safety issues or how other people felt. And now it's coming, it's ripening for you to have a loved one doing the same thing. So it's, you set the karma for that to happen. How can you set the karma now to have it dissipate in the future? So, what you have to, you have to think about in this situation is, if someone came up to you and said, Jackie, that uh, all those dharma uh, things that you have are a fire hazard, uh, you need to get rid of half of them. How would you, how would you want someone to to tell you to say that to you? in a way that would get you to do it. Mm -hmm. And that's that's a tough one. You have to put yourself in their shoes. And I don't have a good answer for that. If someone came in now and told me I need to get rid of half the books on my bookshelves, mm -hmm. I'd look at them and say, why? And they say, because I don't want to take care of it when you die. I don't want all this stuff. In yeah. which case, I would say, well, okay, because I don't want you, I don't want to burden them to set the karma for burdening them. Yeah. <laughs> now, your, your loved ones aren't going to have that argument because I don't think it's all Dharma material. But now, Another possibility is if they have multiple, so let's say they've got four toasters, five waffle irons, three lawn mowers, uh, 20 vacuum cleaners. You just have to look at them and say, one of each, let's give the rest to people that really need it. Because mom, you don't need three vacuum cleaners. You don't need... 10 toasters. Oh, but I do. You never know if one's going to break. Well, okay, keep two. So you compromise. She doesn't want to, you want her to get rid of everything. She doesn't want to get rid of anything. So you meet in the middle and say, let's get rid of five of the seven toasters and we'll keep two. So she'll have a backup. And it's just well you could you could say because mom I don't want to have to take care of this once you're gone. Mm -hmm. And the trouble with that is then she could say, Well, what kind of daughter are you? And then you have what kind of answer do you have for that? You can't say, I love you dearly and I'm trying to help you mm -hmm. take care of the clutter. Well, I don't care about the clutter. Well, then you can say, your teacher said the clutter has to disappear. You can make me the bad. <laughs> she doesn't know me. For, I'm kidding. And this is such a deeply, deeply personal thing, but I'm very grateful. And I really share and dedicate to see that if you know anyone that you feel has too much, please help them in some way. I really put that out there in my heart that you can help someone to let go of something just it will really help them and to see that we can all help others to be able to let go of things and to be grateful and cherish all that they have and can be content with all they have because when you have so many things you can't even identify what you have because you can't find things which is really hard yeah. and so it's a lot of sorting um yeah yeah well I realize and I, I thank you for opening up this problem for all of us to contemplate. If any of you have any suggestions other than what I've suggested, I'd be happy to to enter, to listen. I don't I don't know. That's I haven't come across that. Um, well, I came across it for myself and got rid of it by giving it to the organizations that could use the research material. So does anybody have a suggestion for Jackie? No? 
I'll I'll run this by the Oracle again, Jackie. I call my wife the Oracle because she's much smarter than I am. I don't know if she's better looking. I'm kidding. She is better looking. Yeah. But, but when you can see that they can barely get in, and it's, it's a risk that things can topple and it could actually fall on top, you know. Yeah. It's a risk. I'll talk to the Oracle again. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about it before and couldn't really come up with an answer, but I'll I'll talk to her again. And to add to that mix, um, there's a 12 days of transferring out. So we have a huge amount of stuff well, to bring. Yep. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yep. well, I can't even conceive of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, don't get discouraged. Do the best you can. And uh, and rejoice in the fact that you're you're trying. Um, the fact that you may or may not succeed is a karma ripening from the past, which doesn't mean you won't have success if you keep trying. Mm -hmm. Your motivation is pure and is positive, and yeah. and that's. That's what's going to set the seeds for it to, to eventually work. Okay, let's dedicate. Thank you so much. May the source of benefit and goodness, the Dharma, spread and expand. May the beings upholding the Dharma have excellent health. May the source of happiness and well-being for all embodied beings, the Dharma taught by the Buddhas, always increase. Filled with wisdom and compassion today in the Buddha's present presence, I generate the mind for full awakening for the benefit of all sentient beings. Okay. Okay. So um, Friday, I think we'll try another meditation. We may just repeat uh, the meditation from last month, last week, because that's that's a powerful meditation. I'll see what I can come up with. We are going to teach the uh, Source of All My Good weekend, um, Friday the 1st of March through Sunday the 3rd. So if you're interested, um, where can they get more information on that, Svetlana? Oh, uh, so that is just in progress. Uh, in uh, like platform is in progress uh, to create information for that. Okay. Like to register for students, like it is work in progress. Okay, so hang in there. Maybe by next class we'll have uh, more information for you. If you have the time for that weekend, um, there are two. Two things that really have impacted my life tremendously. And one of them is a source of all my good. And the other is the uh, death meditation. So I, I really urge you, if you have even the slightest interest in the source of all my good, uh, it's really a profound teaching. I, I just... I encourage everybody to do it. And I know the time is, is bad for most people, but like I said earlier, if you want a teaching like one of the meditation modules, if you're the first to ask me, then your time's your time zone gets priority. So Guadalajara. The, um, uh, what's her name? Uh, Layla and Olga both asked. And they're in Guadalajara, so they get it. They get the time slot, which means, unfortunately, Moscow. Uh, you guys are ten hours ahead, I think. So Moscow gets to to start class at midnight, and I'm not sure what uh, what does that translate for Canberra. 
What time is it? 7 p.m. Tucson time. You're 18 uh, minutes ahead? I think that's actually really good. I think that's in the afternoon time. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it works out pretty well for. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Okay. That's a nice place. <laughs> okay. Take care. Love you all. Be careful. And don't forget to think of uh, look for white lies. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that'll be fun to go over next week. Yeah. Okay, now, Natalia, I need to talk to you for a minute. Bye-bye, um, everybody. Bye, thank, thank you. you. You're thank welcome. You for our beautiful class, and thanks for being with us all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Natalia, I'm just, just looking at...